So, I don't know if this is picking up where I left off or if this is starting a new video. But, I'd like to say that, first of all, this past Wednesday I was in Brooklyn. I was at the Brooklyn Temple and I was listening to His Holiness Chandra Sekhara Swami speak. And he was telling us about, you know, the inherent limitations of our senses, the weaknesses of our senses. And he pointed out that, yes, most of the universe, according to mundane scientists, they say that upwards of 90% of our cosmos is composed of dark energy or dark matter. But I like to point out that what's dark to us or what's unseen or unperceivable to us doesn't mean that it's necessarily dark. It just simply means that we can't perceive it with these limited senses. Senses. First of all, if things happen too fast, according to what Chandra Shekara was telling us, if things happen too fast, our eyes can't see it. If things happen too slowly, our eyes can't see it. If things happen too small, we can't see it. And if things happen on too big of a scale, we can't see it. Just like, let's, let's make another example. If I could go about 60 miles above the surface of the earth, I'd be technically in a place called space. From space, the clouds would look a little different than they do from ground level. From ground level, I see bumpy, wavy clouds, like, like my son's hair. Nappy clouds, I see wavy clouds. When I brush my hair, my son's hair, it's wavy. And when it's just left in a natural state, it's nappy. And I see both of those stages reflected in the cloud. But what I am not seeing is what Srimad Bhagavatam describes. Sometimes it describes different parts of the earth as different parts of God's body. Like it'll say the mountains are his spine. And in other places it'll tell you like um, all of the memories of a planet are stored in the mountains and in the bones of the planet, which is the mountains. But of course, from our perspective, we only see these tall spikes. We can't see it for what it really is. So we don't know according to our limited senses, if these clouds are actually forming God's afro. We don't know. We're very limited, and which is why it makes it necessary not to speculate. Where I'm coming from in life, it was the school of speculation. You didn't know an answer, you just did what sounded good. You do a little research, a bunch of people making opinions based upon their limited senses, and then you form your conclusion from that. And that was accepted as consciousness. What I find out from the Vedas is that we receive our information from a higher authority, someone who's actually seen it, someone who's actually lived it, or someone who's actually built it, like in the case of Lord Brahmaji, who helped cons to construct this entire matrix. So I, I say that to say... Because our senses are so limited and so many things are hidden from us and we receive this Vedic information, we're actually superior to all schools of thought and philosophy on this planet Earth. Because y'all can run around speculating forever. I, for example, I have philosophical conversations wherever I go. And I know somebody, I don't want to point out, you know, I want to protect her innocence, but she's from Tibet. And she has some strange ideas on what I believe because, you know, she's... She's from Tibet or one of those countries and she was raised in India and what have you. And so she's looking at things from a Hindu standpoint of view. So today I told her I care for you, you know, and not like I'm trying to get with you. It was a conversation and I said, I care for you because you are Atma, you are Jiva. And because she's so inculcated by the Mayavad theory that everything's nothing or everything's without feature or shape or form and that's the absolute state of existence according to her philosophy so she feels that because I said the word I care for you she said to me you know in your system you're learning attachment whereas in my system I'm learning deta detachment her system she's learning detachment that's the sad part about nirvishesha and Shunyavadi philosophies, they make everything zero. And now that I know that there's no place for emotions in their system, I truly understand why Prabhupada and all of the, teacher, the teachers of the Gaudiya Vaishnava line always teach that Mayavad, this Buddhism theory, is very, um, it's tragic. Because now they're telling you that it's not okay to be emotional, it's not okay to feel, and it's not okay to love. That's not my way of life. 
Like, I got to love, I got to feel, I got to reciprocate. That's what makes me get out of bed in the morning, some kind of anticipation of a feeling where I could give some service, some little service, and get back some little service. And when I ask for this service in return, I'm not asking it for in the form of material senses or material activities. I'm asking for things that can't be conquered by death, life, and birth. I need things that go with me from life to life. And actually, Krishna's doing this for me, and I appreciate that. So I'd like to say that uh, if we want to get superior information, I would check out that Vedic information, particularly Bhagavad Gita as it is, because it, it'll tell you the science of Yukta Vairag Vairagya. Actually, I'm a monk. I'm a sannyasi because I've not so much renounced the material world in a dry sense, like, oh, I do not like sex. I stay away and I spit at sex. No, 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 no. If I'm going to use sex, I'm going to try to use it for Krishna's pleasure. Somehow I'm going to transcendentalize this sexual activity, whether it's making babies for Krishna. But, you know, it has to be something where God is attached to that thing. There is no attachment to the material world once you realize that everything in the material world is originating from Krishna's original spiritual energy anyway. It's all in the consciousness and how you use it. So I don't even believe in attachment. I believe in Yukta Vairagya. If I'm used burning incense, it's not so much for my nose. First, it's for Krishna's nose. Then I'll enjoy. You see, we have something called boga, which is enjoyment. That's when you cook food. You're cooking for enjoyment. You want someone to enjoy. So we take that enjoyment, that boga, and we offer it to the Lord on the altar according to his instructions, how he broke it down. Then when we get it back, it's no longer bog because it's not for your material enjoyment, for your senses. It's for the owner of the senses. His name is Hrishikesh. And once we give it to him for his enjoyment and we take it from him or receive it from him, guess what it becomes? It goes from bog, which is enjoyment, to prashad, which is mercy. So we give to Krishna enjoyment and what we receive back, his reciprocity is not enjoyment, it's mercy. And we enjoy the mercy on all fronts. Trust me, because a life without mercy is a dry life. Now, I just want to point out real quick that there's so many forms of Vishnu, so, so many forms of Vishnu, so many forms of incarnations. As a matter of fact, the avatars of Krishna are described as being endless and limitless and numberless like the waves of the sea. We see reflections in human society of what's going on in the world of the divine. Right now I'm here, I'm in a manifested shape, and in 1973 this, this form shaped itself on the planet Earth and I came into it as a spirit soul. And at some time in the future, whether today, tomorrow, or even a million years from now, I will be giving up this body and I'll be taking another shape and form or I'll be taking my original spiritual body back. So this person is just one wave. My father was another wave. My grandfather was another wave. My son is another wave. These are, we're just like waves in the ocean. That's the same way Krishna's incarnations roll. And I just want to say, when people talk about Mahavishnu, let me tell you something. By the time you get to the level of creator of this material mundane universe, you're talking about seven, eight generations removed from the original source. Meaning, you have Krishna, then you have Balaram or Shankarshan. And then from Balaram Shankarshan, it goes into Shankarshan Pradyumna Aniruddha Vasudeva, right? And then uh, from that chapter Vyuha, another four chapter Vyuha comes. And each of those chapter Vyuhas have another three expansions. And each of those expansions have another two expansions. And then you start to get down to Sadashiva. And then from Sadashiva, you get Mahavishnu. And that's the Karana, that's the original Vishnu, the one who causes, he lays down on the milky ocean. And then from him comes Garbodakasai Vishnu, who comes into this material universe. And you'll see his story now when you go to ancient Kemet, when they explain that Ra, from the sweat of his body, created a cosmic waters of noon. There's different cosmic waters out there. And according to the Vedas, Bhagavata Purana, the Srimad Bhagavatam, it explains how Vishnu sweats, fills up half of the universe, his body fills up the other half of the universe, and how befittingly that we learn this now, because this is the month of Damodara or Kartika. And in this story of Kartika or Damodara, which is Damo, Rope, Uddara, 
waist. Krishna was tied by the waist. The whole universe got disturbed by that incident because we are in the belly of Vishnu. So just him filling up half the universe is not enough. It's important to know that all of these unlimited universes in the material world are just in his belly. We're not even in his waist. We're not in his knees, his toes, his ears, his teeth. We're just in his belly region, in his abdomen. All of these universes are in the abdomen of God. As a matter of fact, the sage Brigu once kicked Vishnu in the chest. And when he kicked Vishnu in the chest, that just goes to show that we're in his belly. The whole universe shook. Even, even Shiva's domain was shaken. And Shiva's domain is outside of this material universe, but it's not totally in the spiritual world either. It's like in between, a marginal section, but it's its own domain. But when Vishnu got kicked in the, in the chest, all of us shook from Shiva on down. We have to be humble. I self lord and master just means that you have limited free will and you're supposed to use this free will to lord over your sphere, your 360 degrees. The real ruler will give you the power to rule over external things as time permits and as circumstance makes it necessary. But no, don't try to rule because you become more implicated in this material energy the more we try to rule this external world just worry about controlling your own senses your own mind and your own false ego you can do that by chanting this Hare Krishna Maha Mantra which goes Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare I would love to go into it much deeper and, and talk a little more but I just wanted to share with you my thoughts that it's very important that we become more humble because like I said, all of us that's running around thinking we God and that we conscious, you are God particle. And if you just humbly just approach a real spiritual master, a bona fide spiritual master, they will explain to you the science of self and the science of being God. But running around being an imitation God ain't going to get you nowhere. You're still suffering from death, birth, old age, and disease. I can't respect nobody as the Supreme Lord if he's suffering from the same nonsense that I'm suffering as. No, you are not Sakchit Ananda. You are not eternal. You are, you are, you are a bunch of nonsense. Follow the prescribed ways that your ancestors followed if you want to be as successful as your ancestors. Peace and blessings. Hare Krishna.